All right, there we go. Everyone, we'll give it a minute or two for everyone to jump on. And we'll give it another minute for everyone to share with all their runner friends. All right. Okay, glad I got my shirt on. Hi, Judy. Hello. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen here and start my little slideshow. So good morning, everybody. Um, instead of a lunch and learn, we're having a coffee and learn today. Um, I'm Dr. Lizette Sunday, and... Can you hear if I'm in your, if you're in your headphones? Oh, maybe not. And this is Dr. <laughs> Carla Solom. Um, Wolford. Wolford, excuse me. <laughs> Wol Wolf Solom. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of split this education. Can everyone hear me too, by the way? Yes. Can I get, okay, perfect. I get a thumbs up. Um, so uh, I'm going to start my little tidbit here this morning. I wonder if I can, is this recording with all of these? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'll start my little tidbit here this morning and uh, go over my slides. This is recorded, so we'll share it later. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll kind of split and we'll do the, um, the demonstration with Dr. Carla Wolford. So, um, here we go. If, and if anyone um, can't see it or if there's a trouble with um, just how I'm coming in, please let me know. Uh, so uh, today we're talking about running. Um, and uh, I've been a, a avid runner. I ran track and field um, in high school, um, really just to stay in shape for basketball. I was more of a basketball player. <laughs> and um, have been running ever since. And so now, um, even with three kids, I still run weekly. I'm getting back into it. Um, but uh, I uh, graduated in uh, 2009 from UND. So I'm a doctor of physical therapy. And uh, my specialty is really doing selective functional movement screens or uh, movement assessments. And that plays very much into running. So I see lots of runners um, I, um, do lots of hands-on work. So, um, very, uh, very active with manual therapy and hands-on treatment, which a lot of runners do need. Um, I did teach that also at the university of Jamestown. So it's something I love to do and need to do often for my clients. And I'm passionate about really just merging, uh, what we see in traditional clinical physical therapy with sports specific movement which there is a, a big gap between, um, between what we see in the clinic and what we are allowed to see. And that's typically because insurance won't pay for it. And so I opened uh, my own company to kind of bridge that gap. So, um, okay, so what running uh, really is, uh, there's not one perfect running form. Let's, let's put that out there right away. Um, everyone will have a different running form because everyone's body is different. So it will be based on anatomy. It'll be based on uh, really body type, foot mechanics, um, and really um, what your mobility allows. So there is not a perfect running form, but there is an ideal way you can run to reduce injury and to be more efficient with your running. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so this pretty little triangle is really what I do when I see a runner uh, here in my clinic. 
And so it's uh, very simple. Um, and I do this even before I look at anyone's gait, but it is a systematic approach for me to identify uh, if an athlete really has the capability to complete uh, the physical demands of running. So um, what we see first are five foundational movements. I'll over, go over that in the next slide. Um, and essentially it's that movement screen that I talked about before. And it asks the question, do you even have the mobility uh, to run as efficiently and as appropriately as possible? Uh, and then I'll look at your stability, your strength. Uh, uh, do you have the ability to accept the load that running really puts on your body? And so that's what assessing strength um, it looks at. And then the foot assessment, lastly, is really just looking at the ankle mobility um, and asking whether the foot has the mobility and the motor control to run. Um, so, like I said, I look at this very, these few things first. Uh, in my runners, and it's not really looking at it just to look at it. Um, you need an equal amount of mobility and strength uh, to run. So for example, if you don't have the mobility in the ankle, it will create problems later down on the road and your how you run will be compensated because of that lack of, of ankle mobility. In the same fashion, if you don't have the strength, um, to run, especially in the core and in the pelvis, it'll create compensations later. So um, let's just dive into these. It's gonna be very brief because I got some really good videos. Um, so these are the five, five foundational movements. So the first one, touching the toes, this is really just a, um, a, a, just a bend, but it really looks like hamstring flexibility. It looks like the, it looks at the flexibility of the spine. Mine is terrible. And so you can see I have a little bit of a flat back. <laughs> um, the next one is um, extension. And so I have my hands on the hips and I am really seeing here, um, you know, do my hips have the flexibility to shift forward or does, does my hip have the flexibility to come behind me, which is really what you need to make running efficient. Um, it also looks at the spine. So again, these are all very big movements. Um, it's not just one, one movement here. And they're very simple. You could tell there's, there's no weight. Um, it's just a foundational movement. Uh, the next one is a rotation. And I checked that both ways. We're looking if, if the hips can rotate, if the tibia at the knee can rotate. Um, the next one is a full bend. And then we have a single leg balance as I'm showing. So um, looking at these is very brief, but if someone can't do it for a reason, it doesn't really tell me why, it doesn't really give me a diagnosis. So in the clinic, I end up breaking these down. Okay. Um, so in terms of stability or checking the strength, um, these are what I check. Does the hip have the ability to extend you? Can you do a side plank? Um, can you stand up with one leg? Because running is essentially stability on one leg. Um, can you do a calf raise on one leg? And then um, again, very briefly, just the foot assessment. So, you know, does the ankle have the ability to bend? Um, it should, if it doesn't, um, most people get in trouble. Um, can the big toes move separately of the other toes? And that's really just a motor control component. Can you spread the toes without lifting them off the ground? And so if you had your foot flat on the floor, could you spread the toes without really extending them? And then finally, can you push the big toe outward? We have this uh, little muscle near our big toe and it's an abductor and it is a, um, a stabilizer of the arch. So if you don't have the strength in that muscle, um, you are prone to pronating or falling in at the arch. So after that assessment, um, we look at um, a gait. And so here's a little example. And so these five, um, gait examples that I'm going to go over, they are very specific to uh, that. They're probably the most five common dysfunctions I see in terms of running. Okay. So here we go. Here is the first one. And this is super common. We call it the overstrider. 
And it's very easy to appreciate what overstriding looks like from the side. Um, but um, when looking from the front, you can tell that I am on one leg for quite a long time. So you can see a lot of the bottom of my shoe, right? Okay, here it is from the side. I don't have to fake this too hard. I do this often because I have really long legs. And so here from the side, um, you can see that my foot is very much in front of me when it lands. My knee is very straight or pr pretty straight when I land. Uh, and again, you can tell that I'm kind of contacting on the heel. Okay. So here's kind of a, a still, um, still photo of it. <clears throat> And so the line that's kind of coming up from my ankle here and going upward, we call that the malleolar line. It really should bisect the knee. And so my knee, or at least my body should be kind of uh, more forward in, in terms of where my ankle is landing. So when I land, I really want the knee directly over my foot, okay? This uh, small line here, we call that the tibial angle and it shouldn't quite be pointed up so much towards the ceiling, it should be slightly flatter. Um, so if you think about that, that kind of picture, the higher it is, the more I'm going to land on my heel. The, um, the, the lower it is, the more I'm gonna land more towards my midfoot. And so this line that's kind of bisecting my pelvis here, that should be a little over my heel. I think we got some talking in the background. Let's see if we can mute everybody or everyone else here. Okay, thank you. All right, let's mute. All right. One more, okay. All right, everyone's still good with me? Okay, let's go back to this one. So characteristics of overstriding. So when I look at someone overstriding, obviously the big one is the foot is very much in front of their body. Uh, initially, um, uh, with that initial contact, you're gonna see that the knee is a little bit more straight. It should be a little bit more bent and the toe is gonna to be really pointed upward. Uh, now, because the foot is landing so far in front of me, I'm actually gonna be on the ground a lot longer than I should with that one foot. And so there tends to be a slower cadence with this. Um, the, the things that kind of pop up from this type of run, so people will have lots of anterior knee pain. And so if you, if you kind of look at at my shin bone here, that kind of makes sense. If you tend to land on your heel, you are breaking with your knee. And so we call this that, that ground force vector. Um, and that's just simple physics. If I land with my heel, that, that stress is gonna go up that tibia um, towards the knee because I am not over my, my heel with my hip, but that knee takes that force. So this can often, uh, often cause shin splints also, Achilles pain. So there's a little bit more strain um, on, on that backside and it could cause a lot of plantar fasciitis. Okay, so next common dysfunction, we call this the collapser. So this dysfunction can be most appreciated from the backside and the front. And so you'll notice those two dots on my back. Um, and so when I tend to pause one and I stay, there we go. So you can see that right side is dropped pretty significantly. Um, and this happens mostly when this foot, when my foot is directly underneath me. So with this type of running gait, you will most likely see problems at the hip and or knee and or foot. <laughs> so it could cause a lot of problems. Um, it's the down and collapse at the hip that really causes the problem. So 
from the side here, um, because there's such a collapse, the, the femur bone or the thigh bone can tend to fall in. So will the knee. This actually makes the ankle drop inward. And so my ankle tends to flatten. Um, and so this is, this is called pronation. And so I want to make this very clear to you. So just because someone has knee pain doesn't necessarily mean the problem is at the knee or so just because someone has problems at the foot or like a plantar fasciitis problem or whatever it might be, doesn't really mean the problem is at the foot. It means the pain is at the foot. Um, but um, really I see a lot of foot problems with this type of run. And that's because the torque at the knee from the collapse at the hip is placing more stress at that foot. So part of that assessment that I talked about at the beginning, that screening is important just for this problem. It's really trying to find the weakest point in the chain. So I hope everyone kind of comes away from this education, uh, understanding that. All right, there that is again, let's go next one. All right, so here's that still, and you can see how, um, how the pelvis on the right is dropping when my left is underneath me. So the collapse is on the right side, but my left, my left hip specifically, is not doing a really good job of uh, stabilizing me. So um, characteristics of this is that huge drop. The knee will tend to turn in. Um, and so this will cause the foot to fall in. Um, and so commonly, obviously, you're going to have more stress on the outside of that hip, most likely on the left side. Um, this can also cause hip pain on the front. Um, definitely knee pain, because like we said before, because of the collapse, you're actually adding more torque at the knee. And so this will, um, this will hurt a lot on the inside of the knee, especially. It could cause buttock pain. Um, people will often go into a clinic or go into ortho walk in, and, you know, I have pain, I run, oh, both my hips hurt on the side. Well, naturally, you're going to put more stress on that bursa, specifically from this picture on that left bursa. And they're probably going to diagnose you with bursitis, but it's the lack of hip stability that's probably causing that pain. Um, um, if I, as a clinician, pair this with the movement analysis, you know, that we talked about at the beginning, I'm probably going to see a lot of hip weakness in this person or people who can't bridge on one leg and can't really hold their pelvis still. And that's how I kind of pair what I see on the treadmill and what I see with my assessment together. Me doing the assessment alone, or excuse me, me doing the gait analysis alone actually doesn't really tell me the why as to, as to why the person is having pain. Um, but that assessment, in addition to what I see, will tell me, okay, this is, this is the problem. This is why they're collapsing because they don't have the hip strength to do it. Um, so if I looked at someone's gait first, just know, you know, it, it doesn't give me a whole lot of information. The assessment um, that I do on dryland is, is much more important. Okay, next dysfunction, we call this the weaver. So this is most appreciated from the front and the back. And so as you can tell right away, if there were a line drawn down the middle of the treadmill, um, my feet tend to kind of weave over it, especially my right side. And there's that land. So oftentimes this is associated with lots of other running problems like overstriding, um, like collapsing. Um, you can see a lot of the bottom of my shoe here and that's because I tend to be on the on treadmill for a lot longer. Here's kind of a closer view. The other thing here is if you look at the space between my knees, there's actually not a whole lot of space. We call this the knee window. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that's another sign that, the, um, that there's that knee window, that there's a little bit of a collapsing in addition to the weaving. A 
a key finding in the assessment that I do on dry land here um, is that someone might lack uh, the hip extension or the leg coming behind them. And now because the leg can't come behind them very often, whether it might be a mobility a problem or just they're just too weak to, to push the leg behind them, um, instead they'll rotate the pelvis. So the pelvis will move forward and backwards, which makes the leg kind of uh, what we call round or circumduct. And so it, it creates this kind of weaving, um, weaving type of, of run. Um, so there's that knee window, kind of like we talked about. Um, and so it's really the key characteristic of it is this really narrow base of support. And so my right foot there on that second picture should be um, outside of that, that line. So that crossover pattern is really big. Um, the common ailments from this really IT band syndrome, which makes sense if the hip is kind of going inward, you're going to you're going to pull or add a little bit more strain um, to that very high muscle that TFL and IT band. It doesn't like to be pulled on, um, so it'll cause a lot of hip pain on the outside, knee pain, especially on the inside, um, because as we land, we land to, to land on the outside of our foot, but then fall in. And so that causes a little bit more torque on the inside of the knee. And then of course, stress to the tibia, shin splints. Um, sometimes there are tibial fractures with this, especially in the older population. Um, uh, in terms of this, studies found that weaving um, placed greater stress on the IT band because of greater forces um, and it placed more stress on the tibia because of how just that hip again falls in. So again, the, the knee pain that someone might have is not just from knee pain and running. It could be how, but the why could be maybe the hip is not coming far back enough behind them. Okay, the bouncer, and I better hurry up. <laughs> so in terms of bouncing, okay, very much appreciated from the side. And so I'm kind of at full stride here. The ponytail is kind of whipping around everywhere. And so the big takeaway point here, the big characteristic here is just this bounce. And we call this a vertical displacement or this vertical oscillation. Uh, these also, these runners also tend to have um, less of a lean, so they're very much more upright, but that's because in many cases, they can't get their leg behind them. So if you can't get your leg behind you, or you lack the ankle motion uh, for the leg to come behind you, you tend to push yourself up and down instead of forward. So huge vertical movement. And no surprise here, if you're jumping up and down, there's going to be more force on that lower bone or on that tibia. So this is a huge cause for shin splints. Um, the, the breaking point here, or the, the break or what's stabilizing you when you land tends to be more the quad. So these people tend to have like patellofemoral pain. All right, here's a side by side. And so I want you guys to see if you can tell which one um, that I'm bouncing more with. And if you can't tell the ponytail sign on the left, if that's not obvious enough for you, um, you can tell I'm on the ground much longer also on that left side compared to that right. Okay, so last one, we got the glute am amnesiac. Super common again for just people who do not like to use the hips. And so the one on the left, not using my glute very much, there's not a whole lot of push off. I'm very upright. And so because the runner is very upright with this type of run, um, it actually creates a longer lever arm on the knee extensor or on the quad on the front of the knee. And so you can tell there's much more of a push off on the back or on, excuse me, on the right, on the right video. Oh, 
Okay, so the big characteristic of that is really just this straight upright position. And so when we run, we do want to lean, but we want to lean at the ankle. And so instead, they tend to be a little bit arched. Um, so this causes a little bit of a initial contact with their heel in front of them. Um, but there's very little pushback from the hip. And so um, there does tend to be a little bit more up and down here. This tends to be a long lever arm for the quad. So really the quads and the hamstrings and the knee tend to take that force again. All right. So uh, that's my part of it. If you have any questions, there's my information. And then we're going to take it over to uh, Dr. Wolford. Do you want to carry it out? Yeah, absolutely. Computer. Sure. Can we get out of this? Can we get out of the oh sure. so I can see what I'm doing? Perfect. All right. Hello, everybody that I have not met. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit and show a little of what uh, I would do for a gait assessment. I work with a number of runners. I would say in Seattle, when I used to work there, I literally only worked with runners, but I use an OptiJump gait analysis system. So that is something that's utilized at the Olympic training centers and at Nike. And I actually trained people in at Nike when I lived out there, which was pretty cool. Um, I have a one meter system. It reads gait to one one thousandth of a second. So which is pretty cool. I can use data and then video in order to see. And I'm going to go over some of the gates that I've done. Um, and I'm going to actually put Dr. Lizette on here. So we're going to we're going to test and break down some things now that you saw her willingly uh, making lots of uh, kind of common errors in a lot of her gait. All right. So um, a couple things I want to talk about is like she said, never, not everybody's gait is going to be the same and we need to make it the best gait for each individual person. Um, I will leave some people as heel strikers as long as it's functional for their body. I will say about 80% of people that come to me for gait analysis are coming because they have pain. Uh, I bet 20% are usually coming because they just want to be more efficient and perform better. So uh, things that uh, this machine looks at are stride length. So I can actually see if you would run with your eyes closed, would you turn in a big circle? And a lot of people would. Uh, I can look at your flight time. She talks a lot about how long your foot is in flight versus how long it's on the ground or tread. I actually am going to break down contact phase, midfoot and propulsion phase. And then we're going to assess cadence. And I think something that a lot of you might um, recognize is that cadence is seemingly supposed to be at a certain cadence. However, there's a cadence that's right for you that might not be the right thing for your training partners. In general, I'm going to generalize here, a lot of people's cadence is maybe a little too slow, um, which allows them to be the overstrider um, that Dr. Lizette talked about earlier. So what this system helps do is it sees asymmetries. Um, and in the runners who don't have very obvious things, it sees asymmetries way better than video even can. Uh, I look for efficiency. So are you the runner who's putting on the brakes, who is actually taking your body down versus bringing it back up? Um, and then a lot of questions I get is what shoe should I be running in? What shoe's better for me? Should I wear an orthotic? Should I not wear an orthotic? Well, this is great because we can pop it in and pop it out um, and do side-by-side -side comparisons. And then uh, another big question is what speed does my body run best at? And I found a lot of patients will come in, um, for instance, husband, wife couples, and the husband maybe has slowed down to run with his wife. Sorry, ladies, not everybody runs slower. It's just what I've seen. And I found that they'll actually break down because they're running slower than they should be for their body. And so you tend to have an optimal speed. And sometimes that means bringing up your cardiovascular fitness and muscular stamina in order to sustain that speed. Uh, and then what we do, like what I'll do is work with you and see, can we fix your gait based off of 
verbal cues and can you, um, if you can, great. If not, then it's like, what do we need to mobilize? What do we need to stabilize? Or what do we need to strengthen? So oftentimes I can get it via cue, but otherwise it takes um, maybe some extra homework to make that happen. I asked them to go inside. All right, so how do I make that bigger? Us? Yeah. You have the two most technically savvy people right here. Nope. <laughs> that wasn't it. I don't know. All right. We'll just make it work. That's better. Okay, so we're going to get set up here and All right, so we're just going to discuss some of the things that we're seeing. If you guys can see, there's a ton of data points here, and I'm going to show you a comparison when I break down my screen for somebody who I've done pre and post um, in a moment. But one thing we're finding out about Dr. Lizette is that um, on average, her flight time is longer on her right than her left, which could end up being an issue. Breaks down all of our data sets here. And yeah, so she's kind of got an uneven um, gait or stride. So she might be one that we'll put to a metronome to get her to verbally go around that. 
I'm going to show you a video that we've broken down pre and post. If I could have you flip it back to me as the host, that would be great. Are you EHP coaches? All right. So just some interesting findings here. Uh, this happens to be my husband, so here we go. Uh, one thing that we found with him, which is pretty interesting, is uh, we have a pre and post, and you guys can uh, see uh, the difference. And the second one was actually his pre, and this first one was his post. But uh, what you can see is that his left versus his right. So he had, uh, in his original gait, he was at a three foot stride length and a three foot three inch stride length, which is about an 8% difference. Uh, and then we actually brought down his stride length of three feet three inches and two feet 11 inches. So he continually wanted to uh, same pace uh, or that same length in his gait. One thing that we did is we looked at flight time. So in one trial, he was a 13% difference and he was a 7% difference. So that was obviously not significant there. And then we looked at contact time and we got put those people flat on that treadmill. It was only about a 1% difference each time, and that was actually pretty decent. But his total contact phase. Um, which is the initial, like, I'm gonna, like, for a lot of people, it was a heel strike between the foot flat and the propulsion phase. That was a little bit off. So he drew up. Um, his foot flat time was about the same each time, but his contact phase, he tended to linger on the ground uh, a little bit more in the, the second one. And then we dropped down to some cadence. Um, so the second one, like I said, was actually the first one we did, and he originally wanted to run at about a 153 feet per minute, and we ran up to 175. Yeah. Speak louder. Speak louder? Okay. So when I look at, yeah, it's a little bit gate on the back side. If you're looking on the right side of the screen, uh, you can sort of see how he shuffles his feet almost. He's definitely not bouncing. There's very little hip extension, so the, the boot amnesia, which Dr. Lozette calls it, um, I just call it a muted butt. Um, he's really not doing a knee drive, and this hamstring is actually working in pulling back on the treadmill instead of pulling his heel towards his foot. We worked and fixed a couple things, and as you can see now, his knee drive on the left hand side of your screen is better. His heel is actually picking up towards his butt, but the biggest thing that we 
you find is when you, on the left-hand side of the screen, when his foot is initially contacting, he hasn't loaded yet, but now on the left-hand side of your screen, he's loaded. So when we look at that, we can look at this initial hip plumb line. And this is not perfect yet, but his when he's landing and he's bearing all of his weight, his foot is more underneath his body than the other one. Like that. Play it here when he's landing on the right, and now he's load bearing. His foot is way like in front of his body. And so that can lead to some injuries, which he is dealing with. And let me go ahead and look from the back. Sorry, my camera angle was bad on that one there. There we go. So if we look on the right, this is sort of one of the other things. He really doesn't move his upper body, so we were looking at that. As you can see, uh, I call it a scissor gate, or she calls it the weaver, how you have your feet are tending to be overlapped. So one thing we were looking at is, can we keep our feet apart? He actually did a pretty good job with the right, but his left one liked to cave. So that might be that hip weakness or that hip imbalance. We're also looking for that elbow drive back for him to be able to have that more athletic gait. We're also looking out for him particularly, it paired him well to land more of a midfoot less of that heel strike um, because he was getting a lot of the uh, anterior knee pain and pain that Dr. Lizette was talking about. He doesn't have this, uh, but one of the things I like to look at as uh, a logic chiropractic is what is the pelvis doing and what are those, uh, what, are, what are the hip unleveling things doing? And so when I look at that, Get out of this screen so you can see here. So, with runners, one thing in particular I like to look at is your pelvis. And you should have five to 15 degrees of mobility in your SI joints. If you don't, that has to translate up or down. And so if you have a hip, we'll call it your hip or your SI joint that's really locked in place, um, that can lead to other things. So if you don't have that degree of play, that can also limit your hip extension, it can limit hip flexion. And so from a bony standpoint, I definitely do like to look at that. Same thing goes for the feet. Um, I know she discussed a lot of the pronation and I just want to make one thing here, and then we both know this too, but you do need to pronate to run. You need to supinate, pronate, supinate. That has to happen. But you don't have to over pronate, and that's kind of where you get into the danger zone. Uh, sometimes people's calcaneus or their heel tends to be locked especially for those that like to run on the outside of the foot and not over their toe. So getting that and adjusting that tends to be uh, something that I find. If you're lacking that ankle dorsal flexion, I see with a lot of runners that can come in and we'll do a towel to make sure that's moving. And then lastly, oh, he's got some of the right now. <laughs> um, lastly, uh, midfoot. So if that arch of your foot isn't acting like that spring, yeah, Dr. Halakos that she mentioned is huge, um, but if that foot tends to be locked up and needs to be like adjusted or moved in order, sometimes it has to happen in order for that adductor halakos to even have a clue on what it's doing. So um, those are kind of the main things I look at with this data analysis and how are those joints and muscles moving. Sometimes I use uh, injury the chi, chi run, weight run, maxo run, a bunch of them. And we'll try and implement, but I, I only give ever three cues because I used to give a lot more and nobody ever could do it. So I give three separate cues for people to think about when they run. And the interesting thing about runners is you guys don't like to think when you run. Nobody really likes to think when they run. Most people run to kind of get in there, like out of their own head. And so being able to utilize those three are pretty key with that. Um, Let's see. 
what I guess that being said, and this is where I'm going to say, do you guys have any particular questions about this category? Over here. Now we're both together. <laughs> so, because I'm the host and I have your earbuds. Sure. Uh, any last verbal questions? If you guys don't want to pop them in the chat. Uh, good question. Um, we usually don't. Um, usually you see one of us or the other one, and we both approach things slightly differently, hopefully getting the same results. Um, if there's probably, if there's ever like a, an instance, um, she assesses differently. I use more of the OptiJump, which is a different training methodology than she has. So we both have different trainings. Um, so no, the answer is we usually don't um, assess or review gate analysis if one does it and the other one doesn't. Any other questions? All right, do you have any closing, closing remarks, Dr. Lizette? Um, <laughs> I can't believe there's no other questions. Um, no, just to add on that, you know, we are colleagues. So if I had a runner who was just not getting better, um, sure, her gait analysis is probably going to be more specific since it could be that precise. And so um, my cues, like she said, she has three different cues that she uses. My cues are really going to be based on the runner and what I see. So uh, I don't have a cue that will work specifically with, with, um, you know, every runner. And so every, every runner is going to have something that works for them and you just have to find it. So, um, no, you just have to do, you know, you got to start with an assessment, of course. And um, Dr. Carla does the same thing in terms of movement and what's not moving and what's unstable. Um, it's really the gate part of it that seems, that seems pretty different. So if anyone has questions, I love questions, email, text, um phone calls um yeah don't he don't hesitate to reach out yeah. um i should say that it's not the same three cues for everybody it kind of depends upon the yeah. person um i guess my approach is with gate is usually you can i like to get rid of the big elephants in the room first there's a lot of things that both of us will see on gate but what's the biggest limiting factor in either your function, your injury, your uh, efficiency. And so we got to get rid of the big things first and then address those little things. Um, and somebody asked, where can you go to watch this again? It will be posted on EHP Performance's website. I'm sure it'll be on both of our Facebook pages uh, and where you'll have a link where you can go and watch it. We'll get it up on YouTube for you. Um, Yes, Leah, you can also schedule assessments on the website. Uh, under me, you can actually book straight through gate analysis. That way I know exactly where you're doing it um, and what you want to focus on. Uh, you can click on my face and then you can see my treatments. And Dr. Lizette, where can they book with you? Yes, uh, so you can go to my website and go to book an appointment. I have something, or you could just uh, click on my face and um, out of my services, you'll see a athlete movement screen. And so um, if, you're, if you just say, I, I'm a runner, I wanna know what this skate looks like, um, I'm gonna go through that whole uh, movement system or that, that running assessment like we talked about. And, um, and so it is just the screen, um, you know, if you have pain, that's a whole different monster because there's a little bit more treatment that needs to be done with that. But if you're curious, you know, do I have the mobility to run? Do I have the stability to run? And then how does this gate look like? Yes, it's just the athlete movement screen. And so you can go right on my website or on, um, on the Jane website, um, Jane app uh, to schedule. 
one thing to add to that also, if you have pain, you're going to be running funny. And so sometimes you have to downregulate that pain before you actually get to the point of doing that gait analysis, or otherwise the gait analysis really is kind of a wash. Right. Uh, so sometimes we have to get you out of pain before that would be that step. And I think we both work the same way. Yeah, that. absolutely. It just depends on where you are in that process. And so, you know, if you're just curious and you really want to know what that gate looks like and whether you have the mobility, that's a simple movement screen, athlete screen, gait analysis. If you're coming in with pain and you, you're a regular runner and 10 minutes into your run, you have pain, probably not going to be able to assess your gait analysis because what you need to do first is check why you're having pain and the why comes from that hands-on assessment that movement assessment and um, i will say too i also work with the distance people uh that are they're like oh, i don't get pain till mile 18. <laughs> so if that happens i will probably have you go run 17 miles pick up your last mile on our treadmill and then i will pick up to figure out if, if we've watched your gait and it seems really good like what what's what's breaking down at mile 18 right like what when is that happening? So I would usually have you do your long run and then come in um, just so we can see what what's actually breaking down when you're getting that pain. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks guys. All right, and thanks. we'll get this posted as soon as we can.